there's 9,000 different forms of PFAS in our environment, 9,000. Just as a context, almost everyone has it in their blood. Let's become aware of this stuff so that we can make another choice. We all know that avoiding highly processed food is a powerful step to eliminating toxins from your diet. But what about the chemicals that we put on our bodies or absorb into our skin from our household products or even our clothes? Today's guest, Darren Olean, who you may know from his many past appearances on the show, or perhaps from his star turn as Zac Efron's co-host on the hit Netflix series, Down to Earth, has a name for the pernicious ways in which the many products we assume are safe are actually harming us in very real, but often invisible ways. And that term is fatal conveniences. I'm talking about everything from deodorant and denim to detergent and even dental floss actually abound with chemicals. So today we attempt to make sense of this insanity, how to know what products are safe to use and what we should avoid. You're in very good hands because Darren, when he isn't traipsing the far corners of the globe or working on new sustainable solutions for agriculture, energy, and industry, has spent the better part of his entire life studying this very topic, all of which he condenses and shares in his fantastic new book, Fatal Conveniences, the toxic products and harmful habits that are making you sick and the simple changes that will save your health. I think this just might be the most powerful and impactful of our five public conversations to date. So get ready to take notes, hit that subscribe button and be prepared to be educated, to be nourished, and most importantly, be empowered. Before we dive in, this episode is brought to you by Roka. Now I get asked fairly consistently about the glasses that you see me wearing on the show. Well, the answer is Roka. These are specifically the Hamilton frames. I love them. All the frames that Roka makes are high performance, super light, amazing optics. They've got tons of great styles. They never ever slip off my face and I'll be sharing a bit more about Roka later. But for now, enough, let's, uh, let's do the thing. Well, good to see you. Thank you uh, for coming back. I was thinking about um, and the many times that you've appeared on this podcast, you've always been such a popular guest. This is your fifth appearance. So I think we've logged somewhere between eight or 10 hours of conversations. Amazing. <laughs> Going all the way back to uh, our first episode was, was 153, that was way back. Wow, Yeah. how many are you at now? So we're in this mid seven, 740 wow. something, I don't know, 750. That was in this back room, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, just like in this little, Engine engineering room or something. It I can't remember closet. where the first one was yeah. that we did. Was it at my house or? No, 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 it was at uh, your partner's um, business. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, we've had a few locations, but we got our HQ here. You've been here many times, but not a not, uh, guest on the podcast. So welcome. Thank you, man. Yeah, man, we've covered so many things over those episodes we've talked about superfoods, of course, plant-based nutrition. We went deep on water and hydration. We talked about barucas and all the work that you've done in the rainforest and the, the uh, various you know, regions across South America and all your travels. We've talked about breath, brain states. We talked about down to earth, I think, uh, the last time you were on, which was mid pandemic. Right. So lots happened since, yeah. uh, since the last time, man. Another season of down to earth. Um, and now you've got this new book, Fatal Conveniences. So congratulations, buddy. Thanks, dude. Yeah, well, man. You know, I like know. Two and a half years of. Dude, I know how long and how hard you've been working on this thing, like an albatross you know, around your neck. Uh, a lot went into it. Um, I loved it. And I think it's really gonna help a lot of people. It's really powerful. I, it, my experience in reading the book was weirdly this strange combination of it both being on the one hand, like a very breezy, easy read. Like it's very easy to kind of like go through it. And at the same time, this extremely dense, you know, comprehensive, almost, uh, you know, research paper where you basically canvas every single thing that's out in the world trying to kill us. And the main takeaway is kind of, 
you know, God damn, it's hard to be a conscious human in the modern world, isn't it? It's fucking inconvenient. It's very inconvenient. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's this, this one, this, this shocked me a bit. I naively said, I'm gonna write this book because I, you know, in parallel to 30 years of kind of the, the start of understanding this with my dad, which we can unpack and talk about a little bit, but this has been a part of my life ever since then. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, yeah, no problem. I know a, a bunch of this stuff. Let's write a book. I'll be able to crank it out in six months. I literally th thought that that was the first kind of idea. And then two and a half years later, yeah, <laughs> because it's like when you really, it's like as anything, Rich, right? When you when you really look and really ask questions and really start to study something, mostly it's 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 more complex than you can possibly imagine anything in life, all environmental issues, all of these chemicals, why they're there, why they're not there, whatever it is, it's always very complex. Mm -hmm. And so that's why flippantly in this world, when you're seeing people just making comments and this kind of click baitable stuff, it's, it's, it, it doesn't do a lot of service to the complexity of things. and. You know, our mutual friend Paul Hawken is such a great example of of inviting the powers that be into the conversation and into proactivity mm -hmm. of how to make changes. And 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 even, you know, on on down to earth when we sat sat down with the professor who wrote Black Yumu, I for, I'm try, losing track of his name right now. Um, that you know, you know, we, we go into all these complex issues, and he says, you know, we say, well, what do we do? And he literally says, have tea and talk about it with each other, mm -hmm. so that we come together. Mm -hmm. So, so it's like, so that being said, every chapter in that book is 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 so complex and so big that easily could have been a book. Yeah, of course. I mean, that's a really powerful perspective that, you know, as you mentioned, is applicable across the board to whatever subject matter you're trying to understand. We go into these things thinking we have an idea of what it is. Oh, it's black and white, it's us versus them. Right. We see a lot of that on the internet. The algorithm favors uh, the us versus them mm. model and amplifies that. And a lot of you know, so-called you know, quote unquote experts you know, spewing here and there uh, in a way that, that uh, makes it sound like they know what they're talking about, but not necessarily you know, uh, is that, a good arbiter of, of true wisdom and mastery, as you know, is the capacity to really immerse yourself in a subject matter where you go on that journey where you think you know, and then the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. And then ultimately through lifelong dedication, you come out the other side and have some level of, of wisdom matched with humility and you're able to communicate it in simplistic terms. And I think a lot of people, particularly on the internet, um, are, are pretenders to that level of mastery and they hide behind a lot of language and a lot of um, phraseology that, 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 makes, that, that makes people think that they know what they're talking about. Yeah. But real mastery is being able to condense it down and explain things simply with that level of humility. And I feel like on some level, I don't, you know, like not to, you know, overly, project here, I, I don't know that you would consider yourself a master on any of the subjects that, that you know, these rabbit holes that you went down, um, but you were able to communicate really complex stuff in, in like I said, a, a, you know, a very readable way. And each one of these chapters is, you know, a launching pad or, you know, a starting gate for somebody to, you know, go deeper into their own exploration. Yeah, I think you, what you said, I agree a thousand percent. And that book is a, definitely an example of, knocking me back a notch thinking I know mm -hmm. and, and sitting me in the seat of like, this is number one, so shocking. I don't know how many times Rich going through each chapter and each research, I was like, what the 
fuck is going on? <laughs> like, I don't, I, I'm reading it and I still don't understand why this is happening, mm. right? So that coupled with just the enormous amount of research that was used and cited and helped guide, you, I'm going, oh my God, I'm a forever student, forever student of this modern day conundrum that we're in. Mm -hmm. Because we all were born into it, all of us, right? And, and, and we weren't even given our first breath and we were already inoculated with chemicals mm -hmm. in the umbilical cord. And yeah. it shows up many different studies, many different ways. And that's the shocking thing. And did you have a choice? Did that little baby in the womb have a choice in utero? No. So, you know, all of this stuff, yeah, man, it, it knocked me back. I wanted to quit <laughs> um, my, my researchers, uh, you know, going back to the table. This isn't working. This isn't working. And then you realize, wow, I am so naive to all of this stuff. And, um, that this literally takes a, a village and a team and professionals to to amass this knowledge and to try to put it. And now to mm -hmm. answer one of those things about trying to make it palatable and digestible for someone, a technique that I constantly use, shout out to my brother, Troy. He doesn't know this, but I constantly listen through his perception of the world. So it, it, it was sort of written with him in mind, like he was yeah. the, the audience member that you yeah. were writing for. Cause if he doesn't, my brother's like, if he learns something and he can understand it, it's not all people are like this, but he goes, oh, well, why would I do that? Mm -hmm. Why would I drink out of this microplastic induced estrogen mimicking phthalate filled plastic water bottle uh -huh. when I can just go, all right, I got tested well water and I'll use a glass. Why would you, why would you drink out of plastic now knowing what it is? So with that, you know, I, I don't mean this disparagingly, but just a simple common sense filter of, of looking at the world. I wanted to make the book with infinite complexity, make it so that my brother, my mom, Midwestern roots of family and people and friends could, could read this book and go, okay, I get it. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think you, I think you succeed on that front. Um, you know, on the one level, uh, you know, you can read this book and, and, and basically the thesis is, <laughs> is like everything we use, buy, eat, wear, everything we sleep on, everything we use to keep cool or clean ourselves or our stuff is, is bad and is trying to kill us, right? It's like kind yeah. of, you know, dispiriting and, and dystopic in, yeah. in many ways. And it's easy to obviously be overwhelmed by that and, and, uh, and, and you, know, you know, perhaps freaked out. It's a matrix-like experience as you kind of describe in the book, um, but it's paired with, solutions and an optimistic, mm. you know, kind of tonality to it um, in that it provides all of us with um, a, a kind of call to action to reclaim our sovereignty. And I know sovereignty is a big, that's big with you to, you know, really recognize our own agency and, and shoulder the responsibility that we all have to make better choices for ourselves. And on some level that's empowering and those choices, you, you know, one single choice by one single person isn't gonna change the world, but you know, in macro, you scale that up and the more consumers are conscious of those choices, the more our capitalist society responds to meet that demand. Totally. And, and that's the inclusive like, you know, you bring people into the conversation. I mean, that's really the macro thing here. It's like, we can point fingers and say, these people are bad or evil. This product should be banned, et cetera. But ultimately change is forged through, um, you know, mature conversations with, you know, people in the seats of power who can, you know, change the course of how we do these things, right? And if you alienate them and don't create a welcoming environment to have that conversation to begin with, you're never gonna get off the dime. Yeah, yeah, and that's the, 
you know, on the one hand, you know, you and I have been in the health space for a long time. You know, I wrote Super Life, super stoked to write that as my first book and kind of get this foundational principle out. And then, then it finally dawned on me, you know, and Harper came back like, hey man, like we can write another book, what would you? And I'm just going, just like blaringly obvious was this invisible, hard to pin down world of chemicals and EMFs and toxicology that is pervasive pervasive yeah. everywhere that is hitting us on so many different angles hundreds of interactions of of lab created chemicals every day all day um that literally disrupting our endocrine dis, uh, system disrupting and lowering testosterone, thyroids, pituitary, you name it, and it just keeps going. So I'm like, okay, well, I'm writing something on the one hand of super life trying to help people get better, but then this invisible elephant, right, right. in the room of our world is just screaming in my head. And the full circle because my dad was the first teacher, you know, as a teacher, he then taught me, mm -hmm. hey man, in order for me to be around you, and I was studying college, I was soaking up physiology at the time, but I still thought my dad was weird. But my dad was the first one telling me and through his discovery of he was chemically sensitive, right? and. And then I'm like, dad's crazy, mm -hmm. right? Maybe he's, you know, he was the angry dry drunk most of my life and now some, something else is happening. But then when he'd say, hey man, he'd send that care package to me in college. You're coming home this weekend. Well, you gotta do laundry with this unscented brand, this bar soap, this shampoo, this conditioner, and don't wear these kind of clothes when I actually then did it, because in order to hang out with him and see him, I had to abide by these things. I then started to realize how desensitized I was um, from all of these things. And I started to feel better, mm -hmm. even though I didn't know I was not feeling all that optimal. And then, you know, so that was the, that was the start. And my dad's mystery became, him being the first person to start in, well, not the first person in his area and maybe Southern California to really start to investigate this through multiple doctors that were trying to figure out why his, he had neurological decline, he had depression. Uh, he, he literally could not, he was, his, his endocrine system was being hijacked. Mm -hmm. His nervous system was being hijacked. His stress response was being hijacked. So finally, he was able to get to like, oh, the, well, there's the azo dyes coming off of my favorite Harley T-shirts, uh, you know, my blue jeans, my paints, my fire retardants, my, uh, you know, any smells, perfume, parfum, all of this stuff. Yeah, all that cologne you were wearing back in the day, <laughs> right? <laughs> Totally. Truck Noir. Totally. All over, oh my, all over oh Big D. Oh my God. Uh, freshman year in college, right? For sure. <laughs> We're brought to you today by Roka. Glasses are not something you normally think about as a piece of performance gear, which when you think about it is kind of insane because you can't perform at your best if you can't see. Well, the geniuses at Roka basically rebuilt eyewear from the ground up. No matter how active you are or how much you sweat, these things never slip or fall off your face. They're super durable, they look awesome, and they've got tons of super classy modern styles to choose from. I've been rocking Rokas for about four years at this point. I love them. I'm a big fan of the Hamilton style in gloss black. That's this frame right here, as well as clear, or I guess they call them vintage on the website. And uh, if you wanna try them out for yourself, you can do that right now and unlock 20% off your order with the code richroll at roca.com. Or you can click the link in the description below. Okay, back to the show. 
Yeah, I mean, the thing that's so interesting about this, you know, and I, I, I've heard you share about your dad many times, but I learned, I learned a lot more about mm-hmm. that backstory that I didn't know. And, you know, for those that are listening or watching, it's easy to think, well, Darren kind of jumped on this fatal conveniences idea when he started doing segments on his podcast, talking about this, those got popular. You started making reels on Instagram, little videos, like little nuggets on this this concept. Um, But it really does go all the way back to your childhood and this condition that your dad suffered from at a time where, you know, not only was that weird, like I can imagine, you know, how other people responded to that. You talk a little bit about it in the book, like, like people didn't know what it was, what it was or what caused it or, or the fact that you would have to, you know, jump through all these hoops just to be in his presence must've been, you know, very foreign and, and perhaps off putting to a, a lot of people. Yeah, it was really hard for him. I mean, he, here's the, you know, the, the male figure in my life who's kind of being, you can't see what's going, you can't see what the abuse that's happening inside right, his like, head. So he's just nuts, right? He was, yeah. you know, he, uh, he must be crazy. Yeah. He was a veteran, you right. know, you, and then you tell on top of the whole thing, I didn't know the whole story of the keepers of the dragon and his experience on, on this aircraft carrier uh, during the, the Cuban missile crisis, yeah. which is wild. Yeah, so he started putting pieces together that I didn't, I didn't even know he was involved in that till that Kevin Costner movie came out talking about the Cuban Missile Crisis. My dad started crying in front of me. First time I've ever seen him cry. And, uh, and I finally asked him like, why are you so emotional over this? And then he you know, told me this whole thing. He was one of the keepers of the dragon, which they called this small group of people that took care of the atomic bomb, that loaded it up, that got it ready. That was a partial engineer job. And, and so these guys were the harbingers of this nuclear bomb. And so he was around that. So that obviously the stress and the craziness of that, he never shared it. Um, but the one thing that it left him with was a absolute annihilation of, of his thyroid, mm-hmm. right? So then-, <clears throat> then Just the radioactive exposure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, so he was already hijacked from an ionizing radiation, which pulls apart electrons and destroys DNA um, and very acutely um, uh, has an affinity for the thyroid. So he didn't have that. And so as I'm putting these pieces together and seeing kind of the front row of his life, and then it's almost like if you have this glass here, his immune system, his liver was compromised of alcoholism and, mm-hmm. and then this compromised uh, endocrine system and a, a, a thyroid that was gone. And then you add on top of it, this exposure, this, this level of depression that would come in and had very little resiliency. So it's as if, if I took this water and I filled up this glass and it kind of spilled over, he, had, he did not have a normal level Mm-hmm. of resiliency to just kind of live his life, right? And I'm very, um, I, my conclusion is that that led him down to a forced retirement with a disability because he, he couldn't educate his wing at the college, right? He couldn't do it fast enough to get people to like, hey man, I have this thing called chemical sensitivity. He would make, he was a teacher. So he'd make tapes, he would find all the research and he mm-hmm. would send it to everybody, all of his colleagues and everything else. And, um, and then he had to retire. And then slowly he had to start giving up parts of his life. And he was very sociable. He loved connecting with people, he cared deeply. And, and when things were kind of being taken away from him because of this invisible thing that he couldn't, abuse started showing back up in his life after mm-hmm. 30 years of sobriety. I'm convinced it's, yeah. it's a absolute strong uh, situation that, that led him to feeling not so great. And then ultimately alcohol claimed his life. Right, so. forced, forced isol- isolation. You know, leading yeah. leading to that relapse. Yeah, yeah, it's tragic. Yeah. You know, it's really it's it's really sad, but it's also 
powerful, you know, it's perhaps the most powerful example that you have to kind of set the stage to talk about these invisible forces that are at play yeah. that, you know, we didn't consent to even before birth, as you mentioned, and you quote an amazing study that the, I think that is the environmental working group did where they tested like umbilical cord, you know, like yeah. <laughs> umbilical cords of babies and realizing how rife with all kinds of chemicals and, and toxins existed there, you know, prior to birth. 200 plus mm -hmm. and, and 75, over 75% 75 of them are known problematic uh, cancer, uh, utero problems, birth defects, et cetera. And, that, and that's how we're starting mm -hmm. life. Uh, and you're like, you know, that, that, that's a, and now with, you know, pre and pro fl floral alkali substances called PFAS, these things now are in over 90% of, of Red Cross did this, mm -hmm. over 90% of everyone's blood is PFAS. And that's, that's a, for everyone listening, that's in a class of compounds called forever chemicals, forever, right? And that, that is, I was thinking on the way over, I was like, what's the most startling? Cause so many times, how many swear words are in here when I'm going through research going, what the fuck is happening, right? How is this possible? PFAS is pretty gnarly because not only are they forever chemicals and we've had examples of them too. You know, we've had examples of other forever chemicals. DDT was banned in 1972. Mm -hmm. And guess what is in over 90% of all teenagers today? DDT. Yeah, I saw that in the book. That was shocking because you would think that's that's by that's a bygone. Like yes. that, that doesn't exist anymore. We 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 got our shit together when it came to that. Yeah. And it's like, and this is where it goes into in the again. Rich, we have so many rabbit holes to yeah, go down. I, I don't try to keep it on the rails. But it, go, <laughs> but it goes and people are going, yeah, but how is it that these things even exist? And there's a million examples in the book, right? Mm -hmm. How are these things even in the book? Well, there's, there's a couple ways to answer that. There's plausible deniability, right? So plausible deniability is basically, well, if we don't test it in our product, then we don't know what's there. We don't know it's harmful. And then if you look at some of the studies, you're clearly showing in other randomized controlled trials that it's causing harm in mammals and mice and all these other things. So the game, I'll just come out with the game. The game is, we're gonna put whatever we want for the most part in these products. And then if there's a problem and if there's an overwhelming amount of a problem, then the quote unquote government regulatory bodies will step in and then do something about it, right? So, you know, we talked, I think before we even recording, like it's a moving target, like this book every week there was more mm. stuff coming out. And even before being done and now there was um, Simply, Simply Orange uh, got busted by the Coca-Cola company and full of a bunch of crazy stuff. But you know what they found? Mm. 200 PFAS chemicals in that being sold. Simply Orange is a orange juice brand. Yeah, it's an orange yeah. juice brand by the Coca-Cola company. So they didn't test it, so they quote unquote didn't know. Right. Right. So yeah, <laughs> uh, just to kind of tie the knot on PFOS, and we can talk about more talk about that more if you like. Uh, that was something that 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 I talked extensively uh, about with Aaron Brockovich mm. with respect to water and what's going on with water, <laughs> you know, shocking. You can go and listen to that. We yeah. spent two hours talking about PFAS. And then I had Greg Renfrew on, who's the founder of Beauty Counter. Mm. She created this amazing company uh, to produce um, personal care products for women that were toxin free. 
and has been a loud and, and very powerful voice on Capitol Hill lobbying for change. But you know, some of what she shared you know, mimics or just overlaps perfectly with what you're saying here. Basically, I mean, first of all, I don't know if this has changed, but she shared that the United States had not passed any major legislation on the safety of ingredients in personal care products since 1939. And essentially, you know, the kind of quote that you have in the book on this is that, that she talks about is, is this, this burden of proof, right? Like right. basically, it's not a situation in which the company who's about to put a product on the shelf has to prove that it's safe. Uh, it can just go into use and only when evidence mounts that it's dangerous, not just dangerous, but that the danger is overwhelming yes. and impossible to ignore, will the government get involved or people file lawsuits or, or, or what have you. So that's all broken and reversed. And when you look at the very long list of chemicals that find their way into all of these products that are just sort of like, well, they're safe or you know, they do these internal uh, studies, right? Like they either don't study it before it goes on the shelf or they do a self-serving study to say, right. yeah, we've, we've looked at it, it's safe. And it's kind of a roulette wheel, right? And meanwhile, we, you know, another kind of overarching theme in the book it, that, that you make very clear is that we're living in an, an experiment. I'm glad that you've had a couple bad asses on this podcast to talk about this because I, 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 I need to mm -hmm. as, as, as way through the legacy of, of my first teacher who was my dad, you know, so I have to talk about it and I know it's affecting people. And then, so yeah, I mean, the, the, the PFAS thing is so crazy. And so it is, and it is absolutely reversed. So we think this is the internal fatal convenience of regulation. That in and of itself is a fatal convenience of how this is happening. It's a twilight zone of an experiment as opposed to shouldn't it be proven safe before we can blast it out to our children and put this very easy wipeable baby bib on our beautiful child when that easy wipeable baby bib is full of PFAS because it's a non-sticking, mm -hmm. easy to wipe off. And just for context for everybody, cause they should go back and listen to those other podcasts that you've mentioned. It is a grandson of Teflon, right? Mm -hmm. It's this fluorine reaction, chemical reaction that goes on and it shows up just to give a couple examples Every time you see something saying like a wrinkle free, run the other way. When that mascara doesn't come off, don't use it. All of these things and packaging, the, the you know, not that you and I partake in, in fast food, but that, that the food doesn't stick mm -hmm. to the wrappers. PFAS. Yeah, that was the, the fast food wrapper one was one I didn't know. Yeah. Talk about, explain that one. Yeah, so I mean, they use this, again, they're taking what is think, thankfully, <laughs> how many years later being banned in the coating of pans, which is the kind of the origin story mm -hmm, of right. Teflon. Yeah, we all know as children of the 70s, we all yeah. remember that the yeah. nonstick pans and, yeah. and all of that, that, you know, finally. But, but they're still then they're like, well, okay, well, let's just use it in these other areas where we don't have to, no one knows about them. No one needs to talk about them. So Gore-Tex, right? So rain resistant, um, stain resistant carpets, um, food packaging. So, so all of these slippery kind of surfaces, they're all derivatives of this known probable, as they say, carcinogen, and endocrine disruptor. Mm -hmm. So so just as a context, almost everyone has it in their blood. And they're doing and and also to understand that the numbers are staggering. There's 9,000 different forms of PFAS in our environment. 9,000, right? So we're getting hit unknowingly and we're not voting for that. Mm. So, you know, I go back to, okay, let's, let's become aware of this stuff so that we can make another choice. And that's really where all of this comes from. Like Rich, you know, just to be straight up, 
I did not want to write. I didn't, I didn't want to have to write a book like this. But when you realize the regulation bodies aren't regulating, they're just reacting to that uh, cascade that happens that then the government has to step in. But the Toxic Substance Control Act, so think about it. The Toxic Control Substance Act was initiated because of PFAS to then give permission for the regulatory bodies to then regulate. You're like, what? Mm. You didn't, what? Like everything I'm reading this, all of this stuff and it's everything's the opposite. Like you said, and, and this is where people going, I don't get it. So if I go into a store and if I don't know which product to choose that doesn't have these things in, you're getting exposed to not only PFOS, but BPA, BPH, uh, PCBs, DDTs, uh, heavy metals. And, and the next question is, how is that possible? And the first thing, answer I would say, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was you know, my obvious next question. Given that there are uh, you know, good faith actors out there trying to you know, influence the landscape. We, have, we mentioned the environmental working group, like they do great work. Mm-hmm. You know, people like Paul Hawken, yourself, uh, you know, they're out there you know, trying to educate the public. Um, but this seems to be really locked in. Like, what is it about our system that is so resistant to uh, protecting the public when it comes to this kind of stuff? I mean, dude, I mean, the only place I can go is we've created a false God, right? And that false God is this prophet over the health and safety, like it's reversed. So, you know, let's just put all this stuff out. And if it's a problem, we'll deal with all of this later, you know? And so I don't understand it. I don't know why it is, but that whole thing is reversed. And, but, you know, I always go to the optimism of all of this stuff. The optimism is having these conversations so that you and I can amplify the message of regular people realizing that this is what it is. There is a huge amount of chemical exposure on average, an average woman every day is getting hit with over a hundred different chemicals, all of which are some sort of form of endocrine disruption, carcinogenic, uh, ammonium salts, the breast tissue from deodorants, you know, it just goes on and on and on. So this is in order for us to change, we need to face it. We need to go, okay, this Mm -hmm. is realism 101. What's happening? This is what's happening. This is why I had to hire 25 people and fact checkers and like pay them and like work my ass off to get through all of this stuff so that we can face this honestly. And then the optimism comes by the 8 billion people we have, we have the numbers. So as we wake up, as we then go, oh, Okay, well, I'm not saying don't use cell phones, don't wash your hair, well, maybe do a little less of them, right? Um, that we can change from not this to this, right? We have better solutions. Obviously, a third of the book is littered with solutions mm-hmm. for these things. So that's the hope, right? And I, I use this example, Rich, of like, you know, you and I, spent a lot of time together and, and we know that uh, in order to have real good relationships, you gotta face not only yourself with radical honesty, you gotta face people and people in your life with radical honesty and have these, these very healthy, but direct truthful conversations. This is the same, this is the same thing, right? I wish this wasn't the case. I wish all these chemicals weren't blasting you and me and the, our children with all of this stuff, but it's, it is what we were born into. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm not okay with it. I saw my dad suffer firsthand and I just wanna face it honestly to then uplift, support and create the waves of continued change so that we can celebrate 
the people putting lavender in as opposed to a trade secret endocrine disrupting carcinogenic property of a formula that they weirdly don't have to disclose because mm-hmm. they just call it a trade secret. Like let's not reward that. Let's let's reward the people the 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 companies that are trying to do the right thing. It's better for you, it's better for the people around you and in, in the case of colognes and perfume, uh and it's ultimately better for the environment. And that's where I love which became very clear to me in the writing of this thing that well, we are an ecosystem, right? So if these chemicals are severely affecting my ecosystem, maybe it's changing my microbiome on my skin, affecting the sebum production because I've put some sort of weird ass lotion on my body. All of these things, how they are created, what they are from in the environmental side of things or the production side of things, are also and equally destroying parts of the environment. So as it hurts you, it hurts the environment. So you wanna be an eco warrior, clean this stuff up mm-hmm. in, your, in yourself, clean up all of these, these exposures. And it's not about trying to be perfect, it's just trying to make one better choice every time because that's the journey of life anyway. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, I love the idea of, of radical honesty and, and kind of emerging out of this, uh, you know, state of denial. You know, there's a, there's a sort of blissful ignorance about how we make our consumer choices, right? We've talked a lot about factory farming and the ag gag laws. Like there's a lot of money to erect barriers to prevent the level of transparency that would connect the consumer with how our food is actually made because it's abhorrent. And if people knew, maybe they would think twice, right? So there's a lot of uh, interest in maintaining the status quo and preventing any level of radical honesty because people like things that are convenient and they like things that are easily accessible and cheap. And that's what we have right now. And just go to the mall and knock yourself out, right? And, And to have this conversation is to tell people like, hold on a second, you know, you might wanna know that all these other things are happening. Some people are gonna be very resistant because to know that requires them that to then have to consider their choices yeah. and that's uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. You know, that is, yeah. that, is, that is like, you know, you're asking a lot of somebody to do that. And yet here we are, you know, in the situation we're in with, you know, global climate change and all of that, like there's never been a more urgent or better time nor a more receptive global audience to these ideas. Uh, so yes, this conversation is, is overdue and we're dealing with a capitalist system that's very entrenched in a certain level of status quo. They like it the way that it is. They don't want people to know that the genes that they're wearing have you know, a bazillion downstream you know, negative implications, not just for the humans that are wearing them, but for the workers that are manufacturing them and for everything that like, you know, ends up in the water table as a result of the dyes and the runoffs and the microplastics, et cetera. It's quite shocking yeah. to hear all of that. Yeah. It is a matrix situation and it's a lot like it's overload. Like if you sat down and read this book from beginning to end, your head would explode, yeah. right? So yeah. like, how do you even you know, begin? I mean, I guess before we go any further, maybe like give me your definition of what a fatal convenience is. We're like 40 minutes in and we haven't even like <laughs> defined what we're talking about here, but I think people get it, but go ahead. Yeah, well, you know, it, a fatal convenience is you're doing something, I can easily grab this, wa- this water and drink it, it's convenient. So, you know, many places around the world can turn on, uh, you don't have a- access to clean water. So that's a convenience. The fatal side of it comes in, here's that nasty PFOS that shows up again. Here's the nitrates that come by the runoff of the, of the the glyphosates and the fertilizers and everything else, the microplastics are now showing up in the waterways. So, so it's things that you're doing, living your modern day life and not realizing have kind of a, a punch to your system, your life that you're not realizing. You have you know, 
people having more and more depressive disorders, more and more endometriosis for women, like uh, the, the list cancers, um, all of these things, cardiovascular uh, linked to some of these perfumes and things like that. So we can naively move forward, but we are, our biology, our chemistry, our being is being affected by these things every day, all day. And so to pretend, sure, it's, it's shocking to people. And I think the thing that's the biggest thing is it starts to rewrite your idea of reality. Because what, if you start to really grok what we said earlier about, wait, what? That they can just put this stuff out on the market and aren't really responsible unless there's an overwhelming response, then we'll step in. Ha, that has to, many people don't get that. Many people in the world don't realize that this is an experiment and they're putting 60 to 80,000 chemicals in our environment every year. And of that only about 1500 are tested and just individually tested. None, zero, zilch are tested as they interact with themselves or us. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's an impossibility for, in some cases to find one smoking gun, right? In another instance to really get your head around all of this exposure, exposure and then so you go, wow, not all products, most of which in the personal care space and beauty space and clothing, actually have very dangerous consequences. And it's not that you're putting on a, the pair of blue jeans and it's killing you tomorrow. It's this uh, accumulative body burden, right? right? So, so the, the rebuttal argument to all of these chemicals and all of these products that, that you know, billions of people are using every single day is that they are being delivered in such micro doses as to be, you know, at, to be you know n neutral and not harmful like they're they're benign they're inert because it's so tiny so the response to that is is twofold on the one hand it's what you just stated this idea of allostatic load like over the course of your lifetime yeah but you know yeah like in this one laundry detergent or in this bar of soap or whatever it's it it's so uh microscopic you don't have to worry about it, but you know, you're wash your hair, you do like soap, you do it then, and then you eat the, you know, the cheeseburger for lunch, and then you have the monster energy drink, and then you, and then you, you know, you put on your blue jean, like you're just, you're, you're basically like mm. just constantly, you know, impulsing your body yeah. through hundreds, if not thousands of, of, of different chemical inputs every single day. So there's that load over time, um, because a lot of these chemicals have, a short half-life compared to the forever chemicals, the PFOSs, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a conversation around that. And then mm -hmm. second to that is, is and, and I found this very interesting, I learned a lot about this in your book, is it ignores the infinite complexity and interplay of all of these different chemicals interacting with each other, which makes it impossible to study or evaluate because you don't know what, the chemical from your monster energy drink is going, how, what, what that is gonna do when it interacts with, you know, the glyphosate that found its way into your system because of the factory farmed whatever that you ate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it is. And that's where it gets just completely crazy, right? And so you talk about these half lives So you've got like things like BPA and, uh, uh, phthalates, which which have sometimes just a few hours mm -hmm. or maybe maybe a day or so, and, and then that that's where the, well it's fine right it's fine they, there there were some studies on it, but that's not the real world. When you actually look at the studies showing real world, like the one of the shockers was oxy uh, benzo benzoine, which is in most of the sunscreens, mm -hmm. like. Yeah, they studied it, like, oh, small enough doses, but how it's applied and what shows up in the blood was somewhere between 500 times more. So it's in the real world is massively different. So these 
people, if they do do studies, they it's so limited and not realistic. And like I said, none of them are the interaction. So, okay, you woke up, you went in a shower, it wasn't filtered. Okay, so you've got microplastics, PFAS, you know, uh, volatile organic compounds, VOCs, all while you're showering, right? Mm-hmm. You're using a body wash, you're using a shampoo, you're using a conditioner, all of that, parabens, phthalates, f- fragrances, right? Then you're getting out of the shower and you're putting on a lotion, well, right? F- right, well, first of all, you're drying off with a towel <laughs> that is what, you know, like has all these dyes on it. And, right, yeah. so, it's that, so <laughs> that's full, again, you can literally- You've been awake for five minutes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly, uh-huh. and 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 then maybe you had a glass of water that you didn't filter or whatever it is, um, and then yeah, so now you're so exposure, 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 exposure. Then you're putting on your your mas- mascara and your makeup and your God forbid you ever use regular perfume after reading this book again. There's great again. There's amazing choices essential mm. oils and things that are Franken, beneficial. Frankincense and myrrh. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. like gotta, get, gotta get like biblical. Yeah, ro- I mean like, I mean, come on, rose and lavender and like, there's just a great companies that, 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 and it's also gifting to other people around you. So the point is that, okay, some of those half-lives of the parabens and the phthalates and maybe even the fragrances are a few hours, but but you're also, Reinfecting yourself all throughout the day, right? And then you're putting on your deodorants, and the uh, ammonium salts uh, are inter- interacting and proven through carcinogenic activity of of binding to the and and clogging up the pores and creating all kinds of xeno activity. So you know all of these things. Um, it's that again that overall body burden, the, the accumulation. And, and that's where, you know, just looking at it all, you're, these are, just think of them as stressors. Stress, 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 stress on a cellular deep level. And, you know, I think the job is, the, the intention is to slowly kind of from the inside out, you know, opening your mouth, extremely vulnerable to the world, right? So. Choose wisely. Mm-hmm. You know what are you drinking? What is it interacting with? What are you eating? What is it interacting with? So what do you you know the water, the you know cans, aluminum, chelating, uh, heavy metals, uh, what's in my food, all of that stuff, and then work your way out from there. Okay, what's going on in my skin? Because there's a lot of transdermal activity of these chemicals, and they're going into your skin. I just did. It wasn't even the book. I just did a fatal convenience because I do these on my podcast all the time. I just did one on the on the the shaving strips. Scared the shit out of me. Hmm. And I'm like, I was like, mm, I suspect something with these. And again, there was monoethylenes in there. There's um, which are endocrine disrupting, there's other ammonium salts in there that think about it. Like the glue for, you know, stripping hair off your face or your oh, legs or whatever. That's, oh my God. yeah, yeah. All of that stuff. So a shaving, shaving with the strip. So that's what I mean, the uh-huh. shave, the uh, strip on that lubricating oh, shaving. On the, oh, on yeah. the actual, uh, yeah. I see what you're yeah. saying. Yeah, so. On the is, razor itself. Yeah, it's a, yeah. And what a convenience, yeah, no, yeah. no shave burns, blah, blah, blah. But then again, you're shaving and you're also micro cutting. So all those chemicals are basically oh, right. just going right into your bloodstream. So- Yeah, I would have never thought of that. Yeah, and this is what I mean. Like the, 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 the apathy, because we're born into this, right? And it's all around us. The apathy that we have come accustomed to, that we stop thinking, my whole but that burden shouldn't be on us like it's not that we're <laughs> apathetic like are we supposed to go i wonder if that strip on my thing is going to harm me like we shouldn't have to go down the rabbit hole that you went down to figure out whether that's safe or not i know that's what i mean i yeah. wish i never had to write this book <laughs> I, I i do yeah. you know i have a busy yeah. life i've got a lot to do you know i took two weekends off in two years because every weekend it was less distracting and I spent just a huge amount of time on the every day, all day, Saturday, Sunday. Man, I have a lot to do. But it's like when you read 
when you learn the matrix just keeps going man and it just like and you know those things where it's like with awareness and knowledge become you know ha, ha, you have greater responsibility as a result um and being that it was very close to home watching my father suffer my whole like like it's a little uh you know it, it, I see life mm -hmm. in fatal conveniences now. You know, the greatest kind of um, inspiration for learning about fatal conveniences is leaving my environment. Yeah, where you control every minute, yeah. <laughs> yeah. minute detail. And I just go out <laughs> going, oh my God, people still use that. Like I went home and I saw my mom still using Vaseline on her face, right? That's just straight up petroleum wiping on her face for the last, 50 years, right? And so I see this stuff happening uh, and and I, I can't help myself but to go up, oh, you know, I'm always texting my team like, okay, this one's next for the fatal convenience, this mm -hmm. one's next. And, you know, that's the, that's the job uh, mm -hmm. at this point. It's just that, you know, <laughs> the, the book is a conversation starter about a lot of things. I could have, that could have been a volume series of 20 yeah. all based in fatal yeah, conveniences. Yeah. So it, uh, my hope is that people can just open it up. Obviously I want them to read it all the way through to get the context of everything because we, we dedicated certain parts of the book, um, certainly PFOS, uh, EMFs, you're setting things up going, okay, this is what's have personal care. Uh, you know, all of these things you're setting up so that people have a good understanding of, of what you're then gonna give them specific examples mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. um, so that they can go, oh my God, here it is again. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before you go and buy a mattress or buy bed sheets or laundry detergent, maybe just, you know, find the, find the pages in the book and refer to that first. Yeah. You know, cause a lot of the stuff we sort of know, like, you know, whether we know processed foods, you know, factory farming, these things are, you know, things that we should avoid. There, there's some of the, you know, kind of more obvious stuff, but there's a lot of things in here that are that are not obvious. Like I, I think mattresses is, you know, would, would be in that category or, you know, a discussion around off gassing or, you know, some of the really what we think are just completely mundane products that we use to wash our hands or our clothes. Totally, yeah, yeah, and you know, the the, Again, it's this invisible world that I'm trying to make more visible. On top of that, you talked about the oneness of our own personal ecosystems and the greater ecosystem of the planet. There's of course, the sort of chemical inputs of, of, these, of these products, whether they're food, clothing, personal care, cleaning products, et cetera, you know, on, our, on our bodies, in our bodies, what that is doing to us. But then of course, as you kind of, you know, uh, the nesting egg expands outward, you're like, well, the packaging that it's coming in, or even if the packaging doesn't seem particularly malevolent, what's the liner inside yeah. the packet, the paper packaging, you know, what does that look like? And where did that come from? And how was that made? And is that coming into contact with me? And then there's the manufacturing process itself. like. How are these things being made? What are the what are the things that what are the inputs that are creating this? What is the carbon footprint of all of those inputs aggregated? And what is the the runoff? Like what's happening to our water table? Where are all the chemicals, you know, ending up on the yeah. planet? Like how are we processing the waste, et cetera? Yeah. We know this with, for example, you know, pig farming and the, you know, the all the refuse and how that gets turned into fertilizer and gets sprayed into the air and people have respiratory diseases and all the like, but it's really not that different with any number of these other industries, yeah. you know, particularly clothing, fast fashion. And, you know, we're really asleep at the wheel when oh, it comes man. to that. That was a sleeper for me. Uh, when I really started looking at, oh my God, that's a big problem. Like it's the number two biggest polluter on the planet. You don't, kind of you can't get your head around because it's easy to demonize a water bottle because it's floating out in the river and the mm -hmm. ocean. And then you go, okay, you can get your head around, it's gonna break down and the microplastics. Well, most of the clothes are woven with petroleum and plastics and plasticizers and formaldehydes and 
things like that. And that, that tightly formed shirt and t-shirt that you love so much, the, the elastic jeans. Yeah, anything that like stretches a little bit. Yeah. Big problem. And people are, you know, women are gonna be like, yeah, that Lycra, not a good thing. Right, so that lycra is a petroleum-based uh, endocrine disrupting, and now that now you're sweating in it, you're using it. It's close to your private parts. Uh, these things, that's constant inoculation of of these chemicals. And you think like one of great example is the Iconics, which has a T-shirt and blue jeans, and some of the shock came by the, not only the, the thousands of liters of water, there's one that I couldn't verify, but I'm just gonna throw it out there for shock value, but I was trying to verify it. It was one report said that it was about 2,500 2, liters of water from input of growing the cotton to creating one t-shirt. Now I dug into that a little more. It's hundreds of liters without a doubt mm -hmm. per t-shirt, but you have 8,000, you heard that right, 8,000 chemicals that are there to create a t-shirt, 8,000 different chemicals. So you've got the chemicals and, and glyphosate, astrazine, huge spraying, one of the biggest polluters and uses of, of, that, of those pesticides on your non-organic clothing t-shirt, right? So now you're starting already there. Um, and then they're blasting, you know, before they write, they blast now, it's a technique. Now they blast with more, right before uh, picking, they blast with more. And um, then that goes to the stripping and the spinning and all of that stuff. So those 8,000 chemicals are now what makes that t-shirt, not to mention if you have any print on that, it's full of these things called azo dyes that are, not only volatile or organic compounds connected to um, can cancer and things like that. So that's a t-shirt, man. Like that's fucked up. It's, it's so, so it's- But that, what, what do you say to the, the person who's like, I hear you, man, but are, aren't you a little bit uh, chicken little here? I've been wearing t-shirts for 50 years. Like oh. I, I feel pretty good, I'm fine. I, I don't yeah. have cancer. Like, what do you say to that person? Well, that's the like, thing. You're, you're, you're an alarmist. Yeah, yeah. Well. Yeah, that's a great question. Like, um, I'm not saying that T-shirt, put that T-shirt on today. I'm not saying it kills you tomorrow. I'm saying that T-shirt, be aware of how it was created, all of the things that are definitely in that shirt. And it's again, the, cumul the this, this growing body burden of all of this stuff. Now it's connected to the destruction of the environment we can prove that upside down and sideways. It's more of that chemical burden that's being put on you. So I, I say not, to, not, not even getting into the, the, the horrible conditions of fast fashion, right? Mm -hmm. um, right, it's a, the, it's a the human rights issue as Human well. rights issue, the slavery that basically happens in order for you to get that cheap t-shirt. What I would like to say is that if you can resist getting insecure that you don't have enough clothes and maybe double down on you know, one new t-shirt every year. And if you can use organic and not sprayed in formaldehydes and phthalates and things like that, it's like anything. So is that shampoo killing you? Is that lotion killing you tomorrow? No, but it's setting the stage for you to wake up one day and really have an issue. Then, and the, 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 the buildup of these chemicals, we, we are starting to see it. We see it in these numbers. So we see it in the plummeting of testosterone. We're seeing it in, uh, like I said, the reproductive issues of women. 
uh, infertilities of men, the motility, the activity of sperm is, is plummeting. Um, Dr. Uh, Leo Trasande has a great book on endocrine disruptor. I think it's called Sicker, Fatter, Poorer. Mm-hmm. He dives deep. I've had him on my podcast. He dives deep in the endocrine disruption. He's got a, a lot of great numbers on that. But the, we're sprinting towards our own demise. Like literally the, the most primal aspect of us as humans to keep life moving, we are neutering ourselves with all of these things, right? It has been shown even with children and diapers, having the plastic throwaway diapers mm-hmm. that those kids have higher amounts of phthalates and endocrine disrupting and they, it, and they don't have a choice. So my whole thing is then, why don't we go back to get those parents organic, uh, reusable, washable diapers and just eliminate part of that exposure. Yeah, the the diapers thing was a trip. I mean, when you imagine, you know, a, a newborn, a pristine newborn, mm-hmm. and then you're immediately, you know, placing on 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 this brand new human skin a product that I think you said they they found glyphosate yeah. in in disposable diapers, formaldehyde, DBP, DEHP, hormone disruptors, yeah. like all this like it's insane. Yeah. yeah. And that's where it, it, it's yeah, and like what that's going on in the world mm-hmm. that that can be sold. And listen, if I had a wand and I could let every mama bear who loves their kids obviously and and has instinct to pull cars off their kids, right? Want to protect, want their kids to thrive, want them to be healthy, and then you go. They didn't know, they weren't informed at all about these convenience that keep being sold to them. Oh, it's easier, it's convenient, it's da 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 da, pampers this and da 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 da. So if they knew that, so let's flip on the switch of mama bears to realize that the exposures that are coming, not only the food, the, the, the talc that got Alarmed mm, uh, the formula, yeah, the formula, the heavy metals, the all of these things, the exposure, and like again, we go to how is this possible? I don't know, man. I don't know, but you and I have to continue to talk about it, and I I hope that people can just continue to learn and expand and become their regulatory body of their body. Mm-hmm. That's what it yeah, comes down to. Yeah, you can't outsource uh, these decisions to governmental bodies that you're relying upon for solid information. Like okay. that's, that's really, you know, the kind of drum that you're banging throughout this book. Like you gotta shoulder that responsibility for yourself. This is very much a message around, you know, the grassroots movement and the power of community, the power of the individual to not just have these conversations to make better, Choices and to you know cultivate community around this so that change can come from the bottom up. We can't sit around and just wait for Washington to deal with it. I had I had Senator Cory Booker on the podcast recently, and and one of the things that he says all the time is change change doesn't come from Washington; it comes to Washington, yes. right? Like yes. Washington responds to these sorts of movements. So that's an added kind of responsibility to shoulder as a conscious citizen. Totally. Right? And if enough people get together and make their voices heard, there will be you know a response on Capitol Hill, but to sit on our hands and just wait for that to happen, it's not going to happen. And when right. you kind of, you know, when your eyes are open and you look around and you realize we can't even solve the real low hanging fruit problems. Like why do we have single use plastics? Like why is water allowed to be in a plastic bottle anymore? Like it should be, it should be, that should be against the law. Like I think most people would agree on that. These are not, you know, partisan issues by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. And yet, you know, we'll get all excited about straws for a minute (laughs) or, you know, we get distracted by the wrong thing. um, When we have these real big problems with so it's not like we don't have solutions to these problems. Yeah. That's that's the other thing too. Yeah. And and you know, your very robust 
uh, appendix and all the resources make clear like, you know, this doesn't, ha- you don't have to be like Darren and like live in the woods and, you know, in a yurt or whatever. Like you can still, you don't have to be a Luddite. Like you can live in the world and you don't have to be really all that convenienced at all. Right. Um, you can just make some better choices. Yeah, and that's that's where I, I I'm optimistic. I, number one, I want people to live a freaking great life. I want them to. Mm-hmm. Ha, I mean, ultimately, the the genesis of super life, the genesis of this is, hey man, like let's be aware so that you can actually live a dream that you want to have and be in this world. And that's really where it comes from. And so we just have to face some of this stuff, be be our own advocacy, and uh, and and flip on that switch of common sense again, that I guess, you know, maybe that's jumping a step because we just first need to become aware of the system that's not in our best interest. Um, but I am optimistic every week. I, and I'm not even being dramatic. Every week I'm talking to an organization, a company that's doing something better, right? If it's, uh, we talked a little bit uh, before we started about like, the MycoWorks company and the mycelium leather stuff. And that, you know, people don't even realize like leather has PFAS on it, right? Cause it does, you know, that's slippery stuff too. So it's like all of these things are so affected, but there's, there's, there's great people doing great things. Mm-hmm. And even in great companies, they're trying to do good no, things. No, there's, there's tons of really cool innovation. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, so I would agree with you on that front. I think an added ripple of complexity to all of this that that began as something well-intentioned, but now has become almost yeah. a smokescreen is the whole labeling thing, yeah. right? Like yeah. now there's all these labels on all these products uh, and we don't really know, like, is this, what does this mean? Like, is this mean anything or did, was this right. bought and paid for? Like, I don't know which labels are important, which ones are just greenwashing. So maybe we can have just a conversation, you know, initially just broadly about what is greenwashing? What is the extent of greenwashing? And, you know, how can we, as, as you know, conscious consumers who do wanna make the right choice, you know how do we how do we kind of interface with all the marketing and stuff that's on the the you know the packaging of the products that we're looking to buy? Yeah, it's a good one. I mean, greenwashing only came about because of the lexicon that's moving towards. Hey, man, I wanna I wanna have a better choice. A normal right. person. There was a great study. A normal person doesn't actually want to drink out of a a water bottle of plastic. They just don't have another choice. You know, if you go on an airline, you just, you're dealing with it. So the lexicon of the people, the population of people do have this awareness. They just don't have many choices. So what happens is is these big organizations, doesn't even have to be big, take this kind of atmosphere and they start labeling things that are misleading and, and, and misleading without the proper backing of what they're actually saying, or they're saying natural, it's a classic mm-hmm. one that has no backing of what that means, plus- All natural. The, yeah. Yeah, or and they just put it in a green, they just, they, the packaging is beautiful green. Beautiful picture. Just put it, yeah, yeah, like you have a couple different varieties of the same product. One is one is green, I'm just gonna take, that, that one's probably better. I'm yeah. gonna get that one. Yeah, it's yeah. green, it's got a great picture and it says, uh, this is a natural scent. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, having 15 years, 20 years in the supplement world, I knew that there was a problem even then in the, the, in the flavoring world, this is natural flavor, but then the FDA had all these loopholes to have other flow agents uh, things in there. So it's the same that exists in these kind of other areas and fragrances in the sense that okay, you have natural scent in this example, but then you have trade secrets that could have hundreds of chemicals that are not on any label. And the the phraseology you're using is just misleading the people towards this. All you did is not change any formula. You didn't make it better. You didn't make it safe. You didn't prove that it's safe. You didn't prove that it was actually naturally safe 
but you just put a beautiful picture on it. You called it something. And now you're taking the, 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 the movement that actually does want to make the innately, we do want to make good choices. We don't knowingly want to hurt our kid by making a, a, a choice of a scented candle that's it got VOCs all over in it, but they're calling it natural scent. You know, so all of these things, they're taking advantage of an impossible uh, group, large population of people that are not doing the incredible research that it would take to unpack what that actually means in that natural scent. Mm -hmm. And that's not okay. Mm -hmm. It's not okay at all. It would be benign if these things were benign, but they're not benign. They're, they are hijacking our, our systems. They are affecting us neurologically, carcinogenic, uh, endocrine disrupting, uh, testicular cancers, uh, endometriosis, the list continues and it grows with this mounting kind of loop. So the, the, the greenwashing is knowingly, and this is where it comes in, the, the, the companies are knowingly misleading people. Yeah, that's what makes it so malevolent, right? Yeah. I mean, they're leveraging language and loopholes to um, delude the consumer into this, you know, sense that they're making a good choice for themselves. Yeah. When in fact, it's business as usual. Yeah. And, you know, we see this in the animal food industry with words or phrases like, you know, cage free or, you know, free range and all of that. And like, and it, it makes you think, oh, cage free, yeah, of course. Or, but you don't actually know what that means. And the, and the real language that polices, you know, what's acceptable and what's not. I think would be shocking to a lot of people. And it just drives a lot of um, apathy is the wrong word, but I think it lulls people into a sense that they are participating in the solution right. when in fact they're not. And that's what makes it particularly dark, I yeah. think. And, and you know, I don't know if evil is the right word, but like, <laughs> yeah. you know, not great, right? And so for the person who, it, but there are some labels that yeah. are good, right? Like yeah. if it's EWG, whatever certified, like they're, so like if somebody's going to the store and they're, they're like, okay, now there's like 10 different little certifications on every product that is even in the range of being like, oh, this is like a, you know, like yeah. a natural, organic, conscious, non-GMO, whatever. What are the labels that are actually legit that people should look for? And what are the ones that are bullshit and misleading? Well, some of the ones that are misleading is recyclable. Mm -hmm. Like, so you could put recyclable on a packaging, like here's the product, it's in a package, recyclable. And you're like, great, maybe it was a shower curtain. All of it was made out of plastic. What's recyclable? Is it the packaging that's recyclable? Is the rings of the shower curtain recyclable? Is the vinyl weird thing that you're putting, <laughs> is that recyclable? You don't know, uh -huh. and most of most of it probably isn't. And then just going off on a tangent for a second on recycling, because you're again you're wanting to do it. You separate your things. I am being a good person. I'm recycling. I'm going to the effort. But now new reports even show it's even worse. Only five percent of whatever you think you're recycling is recycled in any storm. So we so mm -hmm. so we failed miserably. So that's like saying, take your little blue bin, dump out ninety five percent of it, and that ninety five percent is, and I say this in the book, is there's no. Let me say it this way: there's no away. Take my cycle, recycling away go recycle it. There virtually is none. It's not it's virtually non-existent, only 5%. Right, when you put your, your refuse in the recycling bin and it comes and it gets picked up by the garbage truck, what is that? Yeah, like there, a very small fraction of that. 5%. Ever, yeah, 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 which is really disheartening. So dump out 95% and stare at it and going, could I maybe be a little better at not consuming so much that is using plastic or whatever or whatever kind of garbage it is that we think and most of it we it's so layered the the sophistication at recycling centers 
they can't unravel. Hell, most people don't even know that there's a plastic liner in Starbucks coffee. And I'm not picking on Starbucks, but there's a plastic liner in that what you think is a cardboard. Oh, the, the, uh, they're, they're, oh, they're paper cups? Yeah, they're paper cups. So they say, hey, use a paper cup. It's not, it's plastic liner in it. So you can't recycle it, right? You think that you're throwing it in the cardboard, but it, and you can't recycle it because there's no ability for most of the recycling centers to break that apart and to like put it back in the mm. cardboard circulation, put it back in the plastic. So all of these things are infinitely complex. So even saying those words don't mean much, but it's still a greenwashing if you're negligent on what you actually mean, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, and there's, uh, I'm not even gonna name the company, but there was, cause it would cause me a lot of problems with <laughs> people I know. Uh, there was one company that's like, hey, yeah, recyclable. And then you gotta you eat this thing, this bar, and then you, s you send it back to the company and like, who's gonna do that? Right, and oh, you're oh, just just take the take the packaging and mail it back to them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Okay. Now you're gonna so so again you use that as a marketing spin, but the percentage of people actually doing that is a few percent, right? If at all. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a it's a I forgot the second part of your question. I mean, but, the main question you know, like, and so what are the labels that are yeah, valid yeah, yeah. and can can you know give us confidence that we are making a good choice. It's a good one. Yeah, I mean, it's a good I mean, one. This I, came up in in Sea Spiracy. Do you remember, like the labeling on oh yeah. on fish and all of that, and how yeah. corrupt it was? And yeah. it's basically a, a pay to play thing. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. like the the dolphin free was right. definitely yeah. not at all, basically. Right. Um, dolphin safe. Yeah, dolphin, dolphin safe, safe tuna. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, it you know from a you know starting from like maybe food from a low residue um, pesticide perspective. You can go all the way back to pick number nine on the little sticker on whole right. food. Four and three is indicating pesticides and GMOs and stuff like that. So if there's no sign, you can look at the little sticker. The and you stickers wanna, that are on the produce. Yeah, so you don't wanna yeah. pick nine. So that's not even, that's just a part of the, their categorizing for the grocery store. So you can hack your way and to know at least what that is. Uh, there's the um, environmental working group has a great list of the dirty dozen. Mm -hmm. If you if you don't have access or can't afford organic, then you want to wash uh, the exposed uh, vegetables and fruit, like you know things like pears, uh, strawberries, peaches, cucumbers, like the those kind of things. Um, you want to wash really well and you can eliminate a lot of the um, uh, residues that way, but you don't wanna just eat those straight away. Um, yeah, and then of course organic, like you, you want to choose that. I would still wash those foods. Uh, and then you all go all, if you wanna keep going farmer's markets, know your farmer, how are you growing it? Uh, ask them questions, get to know them. Uh, and then, you know, grow your own food. You know, mm -hmm. let's bring back that uh, piece because that could help. You know, a variety of uh, things. Uh, food security uh, clearly could help out a lot. And um, you know, we have you know in the late 1800s, 90% of the of Americans were uh, using their land as their food, right? And now now 2%, mm -hmm. right, of, of the farmers, uh, of the people in the country are making all of our food. So that's a whole rabbit hole of the agricultural side. So get to know your food, grow as much as you can. Um, but again, on like, the, like, like for personal care products or cleaning products, is there any kind of responsible labeling going on in you know, other kind of consumer product sectors? Um, yeah, I mean, you, you can, I mean, the, the best thing is to, first indication is what kind of packaging they're using. Cause you can also see the, 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 the kind of the scope of what the company is trying to do. Um, if they're just standard plastic, then okay. 
Um, but I would turn it over. You know, it's that whole thing of like, if you can understand what your, especially like personal care and lotions and things like that, mm -hmm. if they don't have, you know, phthalates, well, you don't know they have phthalates, but if they're in plastic containers, they probably have phthalates in because the plastic, Phthalates are the plasticizers that make plastic malleable, right? Mm. Um, so, so I, I think the best thing to do is make sure when they're if they're saying parfum or 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 fragrance, and they're not proudly disclosing what that is for them, and it's like this is lavender, mm -hmm. this is rose essential oil, then I would run. Like for sure, you're going to be getting a cocktail. Um, so though, and fragrances are something to become aware of because they're, they're almost in every beauty product, uh, personal care. So if a company is proudly saying what their fragrance is, um, then that's a probably a good indicator of a natural kind of mm -hmm. rest of the formula. And, and then you want to look for, you know, whole, uh, things that you can yeah you know pronounce yeah 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 uh, and understand yeah the common sense the common aspect sense of it thing. i was just wondering whether there's like some kind of you know ch ching thing like right on the pa oh, oh i know okay but if there's not like yes campaign for safe cosmetics i don't mm -hmm. know if they have a a symbol uh, ewg does they do great work uh, i was I'm still kind of hint kind of playing with the idea of doing a marketplace uh, with a Kind of verifiable uh, vetting process. I'm actually I'm pretty serious about it. I'm I'm poking around and what that would actually look like. It's massive undertaking, but but again, having to create something that you thought was already created uh, by yeah, the right. governments and the regulations, and you go, well, okay, so mm -hmm. we as the people have to create it. Yeah, I feel like. That should be the case in clothing too. Like yeah. who's ever thought of putting a label on clothing about how it was, you know, it's like, yeah. like we don't even think about that. No. But if you watch the true cost and yeah. you know, uh, Livia Firth, right? Yeah. Like leading the charge and, yeah. you know, trying to, you know, bring us into reality on what's going on there. Like there's a lot of work that could be done that, Seems easy, and for some reason, you know, just it just takes a tremendous amount of effort to like. It's a Sisyphean task, right, of yeah. pushing this boulder up the hill. Yeah, because it's a you know we're again we're given a system having in it mm -hmm. upon birth, and to now go about it, you know, again we we Paul Hawken he he draw down that first book when he really spent the time realizing if you invest in it, man. Mm -hmm. It's gonna not only pay your bottom line, but it's gonna pay the bottom line of being literally regenerative yeah. along the way. So it's we, in your financial interest yes. to get on board with this. And then, um, and then his his more recent book is just all solutions. Yes. Like, look look at all this stuff that actually already exists right now yeah. that we could be doing if we exactly. just focused on it a little bit better. And that's why we need just yeah. strong, bold people business owners, entrepreneurial people, that there is more and more capital that's being uh, kind of uh, a swell is definitely coming, but we need strong people to continue to open up this lane so that we can celebrate these solutions. I mean, you know, I'm not gonna say what the project is necessarily, but working on a different television show and it's, it's all based in celebrating the solution of some of these things that, again, highlight what is going. Because I I think that within all of this, even if it, it, everyone skipped the book and went to the last third of the book, right, and just went to like, okay, well, what's a better yeah, product? Yeah, give me that. Just tell me what to do. Tell yeah. me what to do. Well, what it's I there, buy. right? Yeah. At least again, it's yeah. yeah. I like how it all starts with a di. Each one of the sections though starts with a DIY, like make your own. Here's yeah. how you make your own, whatever it is. Yeah. And then, hey, if you don't want to do that, here's five products that yeah. are pretty good. Yeah, yeah, like baking soda, hydrogen mm. peroxide. These things are great to clean your vegetables <laughs> yeah. and the, the, you know, yeah. it's super, super easy. And again, we, we've become delusioned to think that we need to buy this special product that 
the tell a vision told us to to mm-hmm. adopt when it's like you clean your house with some white vinegar and some water and put some essential yeah. oil in it. Now it's gifting to your life and your family and your health. Yeah, and I, and I think it's important to also point out that, you know, to your point at the outset of this conversation that these these issues are extremely complex and it's not about good guys and bad guys mm-hmm. or corporations being evil. There is a lot of really interesting innovation in the kind of startup space, yeah. but there's also some really valid and interesting sustainability programs in the Fortune 500 totally. space. Like Walmart is doing interesting things. I know that you have a relationship with Visa and they're you know, trying to really uh, you know, be a leader in that space. And I was reminded of this episode of Malcolm Gladwell's podcast, Revisionist History. And I don't know if this was SpawnCon or something, but he did an interview. He like spent a day at Procter and Gamble with some scientist who worked for, you know, like on Tide or whatever their laundry detergent. And he was trying to like revise our assumptions around chemicals in cleaning products being bad by illustrating that this guy had come up with a new formula for laundry detergent that I'm sure had all kinds of chemicals in it. But the big thing in that space is, can you get stains out? Can you clean the clothes in cold water? Mm-hmm. And, and, and through his innovation, realized that, that uh, you know, his formula would reduce people's reliance on having to use hot water to clean mm-hmm. their clothes. So even though it has chemicals in it, there is a, an environmental argument mm. to support the viability of such a product, which speaks to the complexity. I, and I don't know if this is true or not, but like, you know, that's why it's complicated. Like, yes, you use these natural soaps and all that, but you end up having to use more hot water because they don't fucking actually work, you yeah. know, or you have to use twice as much of whatever product because it's just, even though it's not made with all of these things, it just doesn't quite do the job like the, fatal convenience does. Yeah. yeah, and you pull the string on that, like, okay, well, what's the big deal? It's hot water. Well, how did it become hot? Like there was a power input to create that hot water. Right, so, so you're, per- yeah, like by using hot water, more hot water with your natural soap, yeah. you may in fact be unwittingly making the environmental problem worse, not better. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what yeah, the, so, the amount yeah. of hot water, but, 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 <laughs> That, that is a good example of, it's just like, let, let's look at this stuff. Clearly minimizing chemical exposure, be, like being transparent. Cause overnight, if everyone was transparent with what was actually in their products, most of mm-hmm. these big companies, they would have to shut that stuff down. Cause it's, it's knowing there's trade secrets and fragrances and things like that, they would have to disclose it would be a it'd make Twitter files look like a little schoolboy, you know? So, you know, th- this is again, you, you are buying products, you are using products in your home, in your car, in your clothing, on your, on your body, on your children, it, what you're consuming, the water, the thing, and you are getting nailed with these chemicals all the time. And it is. I can be absolutely clear that the accumulative body burden is absolutely affecting your body. Mm-hmm. Some more than others. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't question you at all on that front. Um, can we talk about uh, you know getting into the complexity of things again? Uh, let's talk about palm oil a little bit. Mm. Um, you went deep on palm oil. Palm oil is in lots of things, food products and other products. Uh, and there really is no valid uh, argument to support the continued ingestion of this product given what it does to the planet. Yeah, I mean, this is just, you know, it goes back to the, to the superfood hunting side of things a bit. When you realize the, the massive, you know, uh, work that goes into the production chain of stuff and and out of sight, out of mind for people. 
when when you are destroying rainforests and habitats um you know the symbol of that orangutan i've you know i don't know if i've ever told you mm. the orangutan story i don't think so the cell phone story of my orangutan no. that stole it <laughs> maybe i'll save it but i don't um, know now i feel like i need to hear that story yeah so i mean just to button up palm oil there's no real benefit to ingesting it uh and it is one of those things unless you literally are fair traded and you have a organization that can validate the fair trade of that said palm oil, um, that would be the only reason to use the palm oil. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, it's a funny, um, uh, funny story with our friend, uh, uh, what's his name? The microbiologist. Uh, Compton Rom. Compton Rom. Yeah, was I, was gonna, I was gonna lightly chastise you for not including Ascended Health in your, in your uh, syllabus of, of products. Dude, it, Cause he makes amazing shit. I forgot yeah. kind of all about it in a sense. His like, I Am Beautiful oil is like, I use it every day, I love it. I, I, I've yeah. got and it. And he's got amazing toothpaste. He's got all kinds of, and, he's still and they're like, it. his toothpaste is like a probiotic. Yeah. Like it's not just not bad for you. Yeah. It's actually benefiting okay. your microbiome by so, using it. So Compton, yeah. sorry you weren't in the book, but I, I have big props to you right, right now, Ascended Health. He's the one who originally you. introduced us. Yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah, 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 that's right. So he and I were in Cambodia and we were hunting, he came with, cause he was like, he was like, I wanna get the microbes of what you're yeah. like, I'm gonna get the microbes. You'll get the fruit or the veggie. You're or the, the superfood hunter. He's yeah. the microbe hunter. Yeah, yeah. He sure. literally has traveled the world and just he'll like talk for hours about the soil of yeah. wherever he visited. He goes, yeah. get me. And he was in constant, I was in the Philippines. Get me the soil. Yeah. No, 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 no. It's always interesting <laughs> when you're coming from the, you know, the customs agent. Have you been in contact with, you know, soil? I'm like, oh, no. Right. Yeah, when you fill out the card. Um, no. <laughs> livestock. Um, yeah, yeah. Livestock and so. So, so just a f quick story, but it's, it, so we were in Cambodia looking for a bunch of, uh, of superfoods and the high level minister of agriculture, um, there was flooding at the time. So he kept setting up meetings, but then had to leave and, and jump on a helicopter and blah, blah, blah. So he said, hey, just go to my farm. So I'm like, Okay, so gave it directions. Mm. We go to this farm, this big gate and kind of what seemed to be a dilapidated zoo. And so we're on his farm with all these, you know, uh, mangosteen and moringa and all of these things. And we're looking around and we're like, there's literally caged animals here that were saved from zoos from uh -huh. who knows where. So Compton is, he goes, he, I hear him laughing he goes, come here. And he's, there was a, a, an orangutan in a cage. And number one, I hate all animals in cages. I, I just, it hurts me to my core, but I never saw an orangutan before. So I run over there and no sooner did I pull up my cell phone to take a picture of this guy, this big seven foot wingspan orangutan slapped the <laughs> cell phone out of my hand. Uh -huh. It fell down in between the fence I, I was behind and the cage and he grabbed it before I could grab it and he pulled it in the cage. And so now I'm going, oh my God, he has my cell phone. And I see him, all of the activity in his eyes and uh -huh. then he was gonna bite it. And so I started making noises. I didn't know what to do. Compton's laughing <laughs> his ass off the entire time because it happened so fast. Uh -huh. And so anyway, I cut to, a guy, a little worker that was there went in the cage and he got on the back of this big male orangutan and he was wrestling with it. And no the way. cell phone fell. He took it and just flung it out of the cage. I got it. He ran out of the cage and there was another worker that was still in there. And it was a little tricky for him to get out. He didn't get hurt and they saved my cell phone. And it was stolen by an array tank That's in Cambodia. Wild, man, in some kind of weird Cambodian Tiger King situation. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know how we got to that. Uh, what were we talking about? Uh, palm oil. Right. Orangutans. Yeah. So, I mean, palm oil, no bueno. No bueno. Basically. Yeah. Um, if there is a controversial section in this book, <laughs> aside from telling people not to eat meat, you're going to, you're going to get some, you're going to get some people pushing back on that probably because this is not like a, Plant-based, you know, manifesto. Right. Uh, you know, I know you, and I know where you stand on nutrition. Um, there probably will be some people who are like totally on board, and then they get to that, and they're like, "Whoa, hold on, it, hold on a second. Yeah. We can table that though, because well, norm- we've talked norm- through that. Yeah, normal eating of meat. You, you know, you, that full of chemicals. You know that growth hormone, uh, antibiotic resistant activity. I actually gave good solutions for people who wanna eat meat in, in yeah. that section. So I swallowed my pride and said, hey, I'm under no delusion that everyone's gonna go plant-based tomorrow. So in that instance, uh, you have a section where I've vetted some companies so you can go mm-hmm. and have a better choice. Mm. Um, second to that is the section on electromagnetic radiation. Yeah. So let's spend a couple of minutes kind of exploring that. Um, this is really uh, the invisible elephant, the truly invisible elephant here. Yeah. Um, and and it's, a, it's a topic that I admit, I don't know very much about. Um, I know that there's a certain kind of conspiracy minded camp that will yeah. go to great lengths to make sure that they are in, a, in an environment where there is no, you know, EMR or whatever, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Faraday tents and all the like, right? Uh, so walk me through like a very basic understanding of what, what we're talking about here when we're talking about EMRs, EMFs, Wi-Fi, microwaves, the differences in these various forms of radiation that we expose ourselves to, whether it's through x-rays or when we're you know, at the airport going through scanning, what should we truly be concerned about? What is safe, what isn't safe? Um, because I think in addition to there just not being a lot of education around this, there's a lack of understanding. There is a sense like, yeah, I don't, this probably isn't so good, but like this is the way we do things and we're just gonna have to live with it. Um, and then there's you know some more kind of radical thoughts around 5G, et cetera. I mean, that's a mm. topic that is radioactive, you know, in its own yeah. right to even talk about because yeah. it got co-opted during COVID and it made, you know, just having any kind of reasonable conversation about it impossible. So mm. let me just, I'm just gonna throw that radio radioactive isotope <laughs> over to you and <laughs> <laughs> you tell me what's what. Well, the first thing is Without a doubt, it's a perfect fatal convenience, right? And we absolutely need more studies, absolutely. There's enough data to show that there's a problem from my perspective. Um, You know, just brain imaging of a cell phone up to a child's head showing the radiation going all the way through the skull because the not only the skull thickness, but the immune system as well. Um, so you're really talking about, you know, just, I mean, this is infinitely complex, but you're talking about, so ionizing radiation. So if there's a spectrum of frequency, ionizing radiation is X rays, uh, radioactive isotopes, uh, uranium. It will rip your DNA apart, electrons, and your it will affect you. And epidemiologically, it will affect you. Right? That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about non-ionizing. The assumption that sets this up, I think, from a bad trajectory, is assuming that as long as it's not ionizing, it's safe because we're not seeing it directly ripping apart the DNA. There was a lot of research that was that, and you're right, it gets so wacky Mm -hmm. when it comes to looking at this. It's just like, oh my God, why is it like literally looks like a, a weird lady talking about area 51. But when you really start digging 
And I believe me, this was my probably my longest chapter because I had to get through, I had to reach out to researchers to point me into different directions. Um, uh, the Invisible Rainbow was a good research, a uh, good book by a doctor that I could at least go, okay, that's, you know, even starting the look at the history of, of just electricity. So I had to <laughs> think about the consumption of information. <laughs> let's start with, yeah, the begin. Yeah. <laughs> let's start with Edison and light bulbs yeah. and go from there. Yeah. So, but, but it's important to go, I'll just make it short, but it's important to realize that there was data to show when we put up the first telegraph that that was causing harm in migratory patterns. And then as we continued uh, uh, UHF and things like that in the, in, the, in the frequency generation and radio frequency, they saw that, that there, there was some pretty direct correlations to extincting uh, the red sparrow. And there was even some anecdotal evidence to show that um, even tracking devices were messing with migratory patterns of, 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 of cats, of other mammals and things like that. So uh, every time you have electricity, you have a, also a magnetic field and, and we are magnetic. Right, so we we can easy one is the heartbeat, right? And so diagnostically, we know this, and we use that. So we are sensitive. And just to add another aspect to it, my dad chemical sensitivity. Twenty years ago, I meet a, a doctor, Doctor Mosin Hermanish, who. He, changed kind of the way I looked at nutrition, came from sixth generation herb farmers. And then he was a mathematician uh, as well as uh, a master in, in understanding nutrition on a cellular level. He was the first, but he gave me the term fatal convenience. Mm. He was the first person 25 years ago to say, electrically our DNA is sending signals through the RNA, right? and chemically too, but electrically those things are happening. And so the instructions of, of the proteins going to replace maybe senescent cells are a part of the process always millions and millions and billions of times a day. And he started pointing 25 years ago, he started pointing me to research to go, this is the electric field of a cell phone is affecting that DNA. And now I was looking at uh, many studies showing that the gylomas where you'd have a cell phone up to your head was creating these tumor like, mm. not, not even like, but these tumors. So, so then multiple studies showing that. So you're like, okay, well let's study it some more instead of blowing it off. So these kinds of things started to, to show up. now. The other areas, which was weirdly similar to a chemical exposure of a phthalate or something, that it would show radical oxygen species, like free radicals, as a, like the, the mechanism of cellular uh, metabolism was being thwarted and stressed. And, and then you would see things that really scared me that I didn't know. And there was one study that showed that this uh, protein albumin uh, that is not supposed to be in the brain uh, uh, showed that by the exposure of a cell phone frequency opened up the blood brain barrier to allow that albumin to show up in the brain, which had a cascade of problems in the brain. So, uh, so Similar to the exposure, I saw stress. I saw free radical oxygen species. I saw stress of the immune system and these things. And then obviously the blood brain barrier, which is a really bad scenario to open up. And those came back in many studies and my fact checkers checked them again. And, and I was like, oh my God, this is like a, chemical exposure and 
The other part of it was lowering sperm counts. So this exposure of a cell phone, and then you're going, wow, the proximity is, a, is an issue here. So the proximity of this device in your head, uh, on your laps, in your pockets, mm-hmm. and the, the workout mama who's putting the cell phone in her sports bra, these are problems. And these are proximal problems. And again, this was, dude, this was a rabbit hole, right? Mm. And I had to conclude, I had to uh, stop some of this stuff because I couldn't find enough information. But the history started me on this path, the telecommute, I'll say it here. I believe that the telecommunications business knows about this stuff. They know about these studies. Um, Something interesting happened. I, I didn't really talk about it in the book, but in 1993, the EPA, which I think was right in terms of it was their responsibility to study the electric the electromagnetic fields of cell towers and cell phones that they had their guy study this and found many of the things that I explained to you and said, okay, you guys hired me. We need to tell the consumer. And overnight it was shifted to the FCC and the EPA's funding dried up. So now- What year was that? How long ago was that? 94. And there's documentation on this? Yeah. I read countless articles. I even read an old fax that was this guy's report. So then, so now the FCC holds it. So now the FCC is 20 years behind the technology and they're only basically saying things are safe based on thermal reaction. If it burns you, then it's not safe. Mm -hmm. They're not taking into the account the frequency waves, the one, two, three G, four G, five G, all of these things and the magnetic fields that come with all of this stuff. They're not including that. They don't even mention any of it when it was showing up in the initial study. So yeah, man, this is crazy that all of this stuff, but the thing that kept coming up over and over again is without a doubt, there's real data to show that a, a child's immune system is compromised. It is affected and you are stressed out. You are stressed out. I'm stressed out on a, on a, a molecular level. Not from what you're looking at on the device, but from the device itself. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, do you have a sense of, of ongoing research and studies that are occurring now around this? Are people, like, I, I guess what I'm saying is, or my thought is, certainly we should be studying this. This yeah. is ubiquitous. We all use these things. Uh, you know, I know what it's like. I used to hold the thing to my ear. And if you're on a long phone call, like not only does it, start to get hot there. Like it doesn't feel like I start to get a headache. Like I'm like that, I know that that's not right. You know, I don't know what's going on, but it, you know, I don't do that anymore, right? Um, But I use Bluetooth and I use Wi-Fi, and you know, we run our studio with tons of electronic equipment. And you know, there's all kinds of waves and frequencies pinging around constantly. And we just, this is part of what it is to be a modern human being in the developed world. And, you know, look, I listened to the radio when I was, a, I was a kid and I had a TV like you did with the with the antenna and that's coming through the air and I'm okay. So is there really anything to worry about here? And, you know, if you wanna talk about 5G, then you might as well put your tinfoil hat on and go talk to David Icke and, and you guys can chat about the lizard people, right? Like you right. can't, it's, right. well, we ha- got- but we have to be able to talk, we have to be able to like have a rational evidence-based yeah. Mm -hmm. science backed conversation about this thing that is in the hands of billions of people all over the world. 100%. And and, unfortunately through all of that, it got co-opted into all these other side conversations about, I, I, I just wanted to bring it down to what is it doing? And there's multiple studies showing that it's causing an immune response. The blood brain barrier freaked me out. Uh, the the uh, the lower immune system 
that's not kind of up to par yet as a child is, is, is they're much more affected. Uh, it is causing stress. And so uh, it definitely needs more studies and it definitely needs the attention that it deserves. And the FCC has to up, update their, their understanding, mm-hmm. not even their understanding, but their, their, their health measures. Right, I mean, the FCC, sorry to step yeah. on your words, but the FCC is, it's, it's, its mandate is to regulate the communications industry. It's not meant, it's not set up to look out for the, you know, the health considerations of, of, you know, what these communications companies are doing. That's, that's the, you know, the Department of Health and the Environmental Protection. There are other organizations that it sounds like based on what you said, were divested of their authority to kind of police and regulate that. Is that yeah. the case? Yeah, it's weird. I mean, I don't know what really happened, but I just know that that, that switch happened, that the EPA definitely was studying telecommunications. Uh, kind of through the, the funding, I think, of the telecommunications companies. And then when the researcher, I forget his name off the top of my head, Carlos something. Um, and and then he came out with, hey man, this is what I found. And he was wanting to share it. And then let's tell everybody. And, mm-hmm. you know, again, I know this sounds weird, but if I wasn't reading it, I'd be like, what the hell? Like, again, what the hell shows up in a lot of these things in the book? Like what the hell is the PFAS doing on my child's diaper? And my, like, why is elastane in my clothes? Mm-hmm. It's causing me stress. So so this one was a massive one. I, I, I'm just, I'm worried because obviously one, two, three, four G, five G, they're all here. It doesn't, it's just because we're switching to 5G and it's a little different milli, millimeter wave, it doesn't travel as far. So they yeah. have to put up more, more tow- towers. More towers, yeah. And that means just more electrical pollution. Uh, and then on top of it, you know, f- about 40 to 50,000 satellites, um, these micro satellites that are, they wanna blanket the earth so that we can sm- quote unquote, uh, use this facetiously, smartify the world. Um, hey man, like let's, let's study this Take stuff. I, I, I don't want the electrical pollution of things that I'm seeing strong indicators that we at least let's freaking study it. Like, so again, let's have a conversation. I'm not the expert in it. Mm-hmm. I don't know, but I've read a huge amount that says this is not, clean, there's, yeah. there's some dangers present here. There's this uh, Swedish study that you talk about in the book uh, that describes this thing they call the, the, uh, the microwave syndrome uh, in which in this study, there was a couple living in an apartment <laughs> <laughs> that began to suffer from a long list of symptoms like fatigue and they couldn't sleep, nosebleeds, tinnitus, skin problems, dizziness, concentration issues, heart palpitations, all of which decreased or disappeared within a day after they moved to another home with significantly lower radiation. All the conditions they suffered under exposure to 5G radio waves are identical to those first described more than 50 years ago by people who received whole body microwave radiation. Now. Is that a study if it's a couple? Like it's almost yeah. anecdotal. Like I don't, yeah. I don't know that you can really extra, extract from that anything all that meaningful from a scientific perspective, but from an anecdotal perspective, like, okay, well, that's sort of concerning. Yeah, yeah. And again, you know, I, I gave those examples simply because it's happening to many people, similar to my father, like two great tech wellness companies, one's literally called Tech Wellness, another company out of the UK is called Conscious Spaces. Both of those women who started those companies were chemically or were, were electrosensitive. So they started minimizing uh, companies. Now, we're not talking about the famous sticker to put on your, we're talking about blocking devices. We're talking about plugging back in, turning off Wi-Fi, mm-hmm. turning off at night. And that's the thing, if people like, one of the minimal things that you can do is turn off your Wi-Fi at night, 
right? That's a stress that you don't need and you're not using. So, uh, and cause we go on to, to talk about the multiple mice studies that start to show up uh, a, around the blood brain barrier, the immune response and things like that. So yeah, there's a anecdotal, there's tons yeah. uh, similar to my father. It's a trip, man. Did you think when you were putting this book together, like maybe I should just leave the whole 5G thing out of it? For for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But it's it's there's too much compelling information to just leave it, you know? It's mm. like it's it's the 5G side of it is we are think about the theme here. We are, all of these fatal conveniences that we're talking about, they haven't done the proper studies to deem them safe. And there's the, it's the same playbook. They haven't proven that 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G are completely safe. So I'm just raising my hand going, hey man, before we're blasting us all the time 24 seven and we don't have a choice, let's dig into it. Tell me that it's safe, not just, you know, of course it's safe. And, uh, you know, no, we need double bind control trials to show me, to prove that, please disprove the, the research studies that, that I read, please disprove them, show me. Like we need this kind of action and actionable things. And the, the awareness that I hope everyone starts to understand is there are things that are going on in this world that unfortunately have greater uh, motivations than the, the health of us and our environment. And we need to you know, hold more accountability for some of these people so that we can, you know, again, we have numbers on our side. So let's mm. turn on that common sense and just ask questions, man. Like let's ask for these things for change and ask these questions so that we can like go, okay, prove to me they're safe and I'm good. Mm -hmm. So I, in the meantime, I use blocking safe sleeve on it. I use these other companies. I plug back in, by the way, plugging in it's a lot faster. And yeah, just I, ethernet it. And yeah. you do, you're like, oh, here are some cases you can use and here's some other thing. You know, you can go all the way to the extreme using the Faraday tent, like, you know, to like right. really block it out and yeah. go full Ben Greenfield on the whole thing. Yeah. Um, but there are very simple fixes that, that you know, are not that inconvenient. 100%. Um, which is the case for all the categories throughout the book. So again, in the appendices, all sorts of suggestions, products that you vetted, et cetera. But I think, you know, to kind of close this out and, and you know, bring this to some level of finality for today, uh, there is a, a sense that I have that one could read this and, and, and be like overwhelmed. Like, mm. okay, well, like, okay, you don't have, you only have to change one thing, which is basically everything. Like every single product in your house, every appliance that you have, yeah. the paint on your walls and the car, you gotta strip out the carpets and throw your mattress out and like get rid of all your clothes. Like it's a lot, dude, yeah. right? Yeah. So if somebody's embarking on this journey and they're like, okay, well, I gotta start somewhere. Like what are the, what are the, you know, the things that are the most important to address first maybe paired with the easiest changes or most convenient changes to make to you know launch somebody on their own you know version of your journey yeah great question rich i mean i i th i think of it in this way go in to out so the vulnerability of opening your mouth and consuming a liquid or water or food start there cuz that that is there's plenty so probably the easiest one is filter your water because we know that that's, that's affecting 98% of many parts of the country in PFAS and microplastics. So filter your water, an RO system, distillation, RO is super easy. RO is reverse, reverse osmosis. Os yep, reverse osmosis. And again, like I've said many times before, add some unrefined salt. Um, and also, not all Himalayan salt is created equal. Not all salt is, it can be microplastics and that stuff too. But so go to places like Real Salt, there's a mine in Utah or uh, the original Him Himalayan salt. It's got a long, great track record, things like that. So add the uh, stuff back in. And then, you know, what else 
are you consuming? So looking at your food, containers wrapping your food, hot, it wrap, hot food wrapped in plastic is a perfect prescription for uh, uh, phthalates, PFAS, uh, microplastics, estrogens, all of that stuff. So minimize that, right? And then minimize ultra processed food because everything from uh, heavy metals and PFAS and, and other bisphenols are showing up also in that. So food is a good water beverage food. Uh, and then longer things that you're putting on your body. So what I mean by that is lotions that are staying on your body. Uh, these things you should be uh, looking for natural <laughs> products, many of which I've uh, vetted in there that are clean and healthy for your skin and doesn't disrupt that precious microbiome. And then things like shampoos and conditioners, you're, you, they're not is, is staying on the largest portions of your body as much. But then again, just think of it, keep going out, improve your bathroom situation, uh, I have this great company that I like called Bite, Bite mm. Toothpaste. And yeah, so I got some, they sent me some of their products. They're, they're incredible. They're like tablets for yeah. brushing your teeth, right? Yeah, so you yeah. throw a tablet in, you bite down, you just brush normally. And then it's all compostable, uh, refillable glass jars. You're eliminating that, the, the harsh chemicals, then stabilizers and uh, uh, things in your toothpaste because that's a chemi chemical soup. Uh, so again, that's going in your mouth, dental floss. That, that was a big one too. Oof. So that slippery little yeah. sliding, guess what that is? PFAS, man, don't that's, put that in your mouth. That's fucked up. That's crazy. So, you know, what I do is I get a bamboo charcoal dental floss. I just wet it and it's basically as good. So just wet it first, boom. You don't have to put PFAS in your mouth ever again. I'm disappointed that you don't make your own dental floss though. <laughs> <laughs> Weaving it yeah. in the back 40. Uh, sorry, Rich, I got, I'm, gonna, I'm running late I'm running to the late. podcast. I, <laughs> I got this yucca, yucca plant would be good. Actually pull that apart, that would actually work. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a reel uh -huh. uh, on Instagram just for you. On All right, one. good. Um, and then, you know, work your way out work your way out to your clothing and be more responsible like that. Work your way out to your, your home, what kind of cleaning products, things like that. And just keep uh, you know, moving forward. You don't have to be perfect, but you're just moving forward to clean up your environment so that you can have the best life ever. Right on, man. Um, I love you, buddy. I you did a great man. job with this book. Thank it's you. it's a real act of, of public service and uh, I think it's gonna do really well, man. Can't wait for it to be out in the world and, and start impacting people so we can change the world. Thanks, dude. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's like a guide, I think, that I hope that people can just open it up and, and learn a little something every day and I've started applying it. So whew, that was yeah, a man. big lift for sure. Yeah, and anything else up on the horizon that you're, you wanna talk about? Yeah, you I got mean, a lot of shit going on. I we did. could we could spend five more hours talking oh, about all the projects you got your yeah muddy paws in. Yeah, I mean uh, you know down to earth, you know season uh, three. It doesn't look we like it's going to happen. Um, mm. uh, there's some challenges with many different things, but I'm not going to divulge it. But I hinted at it. I am working on some really cool other television projects that are. I'm stoked about, and um, again, all solution based moving forward, still working to build out my house. Um, yeah, and still in the year working on getting oh the uh, in the sustainable housing project uh, up on its feet. Yeah, and you know, I got a new partner with Barucas with Steve Fabos, mm -hmm. and it, we cleaned up a lot of things. So I'm, I'm so excited for that business and that nut to get out, putting my formulator hat back on. So I'm formulating some stuff with, with the nut and other superfoods and stuff. So that I'm stoked about. And then, you know, working in the clean energy space with my crazy friends uh, mm -hmm. in the science community and um, clean energy tech. So that's some of the stuff that people don't know much about because it's not public, but we're working with governments around the world and um, uh, New Zealand, Australia, uh, Mexico, 
and 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 here in the states too of creating clean power mm. and that's a whole other thing but yeah it just helps to you know you know we're here and so i just want to give it my best you right know? on man yeah well maybe you can come back and we can do a whole clean en- energy mm. conversation in the meantime baruka's you know this is we didn't even mention baruka's until the very end here yeah. but um is it available nationwide? Can people overseas get it? If people wanna, you gotta check out Baruka's Nut. Oh, man. Go this listen to our other podcast about it, but a delicious, super nutritious, super food uh, nut product that is your company. Yeah, it's the greatest, it's the greatest nut ever. I mean, it mm-hmm. literally checks all the boxes uh, and meaning that it's, we had a, which maybe you didn't know, we had a third party Swiss company do an audit of our, process of how we collect the nut, how we work with the nut, how we deliver the nut and, and the whole process of fair trade and planting trees and supporting the biome and the Sahadu. And we, we uh, rated higher than any company that they've ever mm. tested. So we're a, a, a carbon sink by us literally just being in business today and we're still improving on that process. So yeah, people can get the the product nationwide. I really hope that the UK and other places open up soon. Um, but it's it's delicious, it's my passion. It kind of represents the superfood side of me because it gets to support the people there, help a biome that's being hurt with deforestation. And, and the customers get to not only have the micronutrients of a wild food, but they get to enjoy it as well. Mm. And all your guests now will be. Yeah, uh, you, gotta, you gotta keep us stocked over here. I will, I'll, for sure. I, I will happily pawn them off on every <laughs> guest that walks in here. Um, so I assume it's in, I, I know it's in a variety of supermarkets here, but should people try to buy it online or should they look for it in their like natural foods market or? Well, you can certainly help us out by asking for your local grocer to carry it. Uh, and then they'll the you know we're gonna do some bigger campaigns, but you can get it online. And most people don't know we have an amazing butter and we have the chocolate covered because mm-hmm. early in the early days we would be stocked up and then we'd lose st- we didn't have the mechanism sorted out, so we would be start and stop. So now we're guns blazing. Mm-hmm. Barucas dot com. Barucas dot com. All right. In the meantime, pick up fatal conveniences and. Uh, just sit quietly at home and await Darren's uh, next appearance on the podcast, whenever that might be. All right, like I said, I love you, buddy. Love you too, And uh, I'm here to support you. Love you, thank you, brother. Cheers, peace, plants.